Oh, brilliant. So we've got uh, Umberto over here, who's also um, introducing him. So Umberto, who wrote in the chat, a small introduction. Umberto, what I'm going to challenge you is to do... So, so first of all, as I said, so we're recording the talk, and this is, of course, for sharing knowledge. Rebecca is very generous in letting us record it, because that also means that we stay with this resource within ECOPC, and we get to publish it. So we get to really sort of have a, have a, a resource that people can go back to in terms of understanding what, what climate cafes are um, and what they are for. Um, what I want to ask you is that um, we will, as I've said, we will find a short time for questions and answers by the end of it. But what I encourage you to do is rather than formulating all your questions uh, by the end of the talk, perhaps as you listen to Rebecca, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can write the question down on the chat because Tanya will also be having a look at the questions, you know, and that means that when we finally go to Q&A, that will allow us to be more effective and to fit a greater number of questions if you're asking them on the chat, writing them down as you go along. Um, so that's incredibly uh, useful. And on my side, I'm just going to very briefly um, uh, introduce uh, Rebecca. Uh, and Rebecca is an organizational consultant, facilitator and coach based in Oxford, UK. Um, she specializes in helping people process the feelings that are evoked by working on the climate crisis, whether as sustainability professionals within organizations or in campaigning groups or simply as citizens. She is um, a board member of CPA, so Climate Psychology Alliance, uh, leading the work on climate cafes and recently submitted her doctoral thesis at the University of um, Essex um, Tavistock Center on leadership in uh, climate change um, organizations. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for being here with us. We'll be delighted to have you with, with us. And, uh, and we're delighted that we've got some ECOPSI uh, members who have trained with Rebecca to win climate cafes. So that also means that we get to do our first proper Portuguese climate cafe today after Rebecca's talk. So it's a great share of knowledge and I'll, on that note, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro, and um, and good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to be here. Uh, wonderful to meet you all, um, the, the ones that I haven't previously met, as Pedro says. And I know that um, several of you have been to the training that we do in CPA on uh, on climate cafes, on how to host and facilitate. Um, I'm going to tell you, um, I think, a fairly personal story, as well as, I hope, um, offer some, some thoughts about the principles of climate cafes. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so because I, I do have some slides. And I've, I've given the talk this slightly playful title of uh, what and why are climate cafes um, because I think that the the question of the what is very um, very closely linked with the why um, and there is also a question of you know whose climate cafes are we talking about um, because there are actually some uh, there are lots of different kinds of climate cafes and the name, the title is used for um, several different kinds of approaches. So I'm going to be talking about um, how we do climate cafes in the CPA and how I came to the, the, um, the thought that this kind of approach might be helpful. So um, I think the, the first thing um, I'll, I'll do is just, just I'll, I'll just show you what I'm planning to say. So it's kind of my story. Then a definition of what we mean by climate cafes in CPA, moving on to why they're needed, and that's that's the discussion of climate psychology. Um, and then the, the design principles, the way we um, uh, kind of think about them, what differentiates them from other kinds of activities. Um, and then moving into d discussion and questions. And um, as Pedro says, please, please capture your questions as, as I go. Um, and um, they may not be questions, they may be comments or thoughts. And um, I'd be really interested to hear what you what you have to say in response to to my talk. So, yeah, um, in 2018. We had in this country, we had the first of what we think of as a really serious heat wave. Um, a really hot summer by UK standards. Um, and I live in kind of central England, um, 
where uh, we don't generally get very intense, very extreme weather. Um, and I'm very aware that I'm talking to Portuguese people and you have um, much more extreme experience of, um, of, of extreme heat and, and other kinds of um, manifestations of climate change than we do here. But it, it's, it's what it's like for a particular society, isn't it? What are the changes that people are beginning to experience? And what I found was that in that summer where the heat just went on and on, there was no rain, um, or there was no rain by British standards, you know, there was some rain, but there was very little rain. Um, and we started to see um, strange effects like this picture that you can see here of um, uh, a park in the middle of Sherwood Forest, you know, Robin Hood's Forest in Nottinghamshire, um, where you can see an old house uh, that was not visible before, um, but because of the because of how dry it all got, you can see the shape of the foundations of the house, and trees were dying, and people were giving each other advice that we uh, of, of how to manage heat um, at night and that kind of thing, things we don't we have never learned how to do here. So people were, you know, my friends, my relatives who normally avoided talking about climate change were really beginning to do that. And people were not just saying, oh, it's a heat wave and talking about ice cream and, and the beach. They were worried. You could see people expressing worries in ways that I hadn't seen before. Um, and so I was beginning to think, OK, so maybe people are beginning to um, kind of find find it possible to talk about this, this thing which has been around which previously there has been such silence. And I wondered if there was a way of supporting that, enabling people to continue to have those conversations um, in ways that didn't make them just feel worse or um, guilty, um, or you know somehow like I've never talked about this before and that makes me a bad person and so therefore I shouldn't be talking about it now. And I had recently discovered this, um, this thing called Death Cafe, um, deathcafe.com, um, which is um, quite a relatively old, well-established process um, set up in order to increase awareness of death with a view to helping people make the most of their finite lives, their short lives, excuse me. <coughs> um, and the principles of death cafes were that you you meet you eat cake you drink tea and you discuss death and it's an English thing so you know the tea is kind of significant uh, and the cake is significant too and I thought this was a really interesting model and I wondered if it could be used in um, uh, as, as part of helping people to to talk about climate so in late 2018 I did my first climate cafe here in Oxford and um, it was very much like a death cafe. And we had a few people, not very many people, um, and a lot of confusion about what, what we were there for. A lot of people who thought it was um, a gathering for people to plan climate action or learn how to um, put solar panels on their roofs or make their homes more insulated. Um, but uh, a kind of willingness to give it a go. And um, we, tried, we tried what was then a very early version of climate cafes and it seemed to be, seemed to be okay. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just keep going. And then I joined, um, I became more active in the Climate Psychology Alliance and our, um, our strap line at CPA is facing difficult truths. And um, I began to talk to others with more experience than I had in, um, in the psychology of climate change. Um, and I began to adapt the model of climate cafes and really begin to try to, you know, to, to think about what is the difference between providing a space where people can talk about death and providing a space where people can talk about climate. Um, and these monthly cafes I was running also gave me um, the experience that helped me to think, okay, yes, I can beginning to see the differences. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stop there in terms of the story and just um, show you that my definitions of climate cafes that some of you have already seen in in the CPA training, um, but I think it's just helpful to have that there for us all to um, uh, to, to to see the same thing, um, and then I'll come back to the, the ways in which we adapted it and um, and what the principles are for uh, for the design. So this is this is our, our definition in CPA. 
Um, it's a gathering of people with facilitators um, and it might be um, just a single gathering or it might be a repeated gathering um, and the purpose is to share responses to the climate crisis and it is meant to be warm friendly hospitable so there should be there should be hot drinks there should be things to eat um, probably not alcohol we would say because um, for reasons which I'll come to um, but making it feel like a place where people are sharing um, the things that make us human, um, talking, um, sharing food and drink. Um, and of course, we can't do that on Zoom. And you're doing um, an online cafe and I've been doing online cafes as well. But I think it's still possible to model, to demonstrate, to um, uh, enact the hospitality and the warmth. And... We, we in climate cafes we also um, are, are meant to be opening things up that are normally shut down so we're exploring things that are often taboo or things that we have just not talked about very much and so we don't quite have the words for them yet um, so hard to talk about because you know we haven't before and so people need to talk with each other before they can really start to put into words some of the feelings that they have so if you like, it's a, it, the purpose is to socialize this, these kinds of conversations. And like death cafes, we have no guest speakers, we have no lectures, we have no advice. And we have also added, there is no commitment to you know, join an environmental group um, or to come back to another climate cafe. Um, and really crucially and this is one of the big differences with death cafes this is not a space where we talk about climate action it's not that we don't think climate action is important and many of you were saying just now in your introductions how you know you need to keep going despite how you're feeling absolutely very very important i think but if we can keep the action out of the climate cafes we we have we have discovered that that seems to help and I'll, again i will explain what i mean by that um, in a minute. Um, so then, and we have some principles that we that we state at the beginning of a climate cafe. This is a kind of introduction to it. It's a haven. It's a thinking space. It's a place where we, we can leave behind all our busyness, all the things we do all the time, all our climate actions, if we're part of that. We're not here to persuade anybody of anything. We're not here to lead people to any decision or conclusion or course of action. And as I've already said, um, it is, it's about our thoughts and feelings rather than what we're doing. And the reason that um, we, we, we keep the action out of it is because some of the feelings and defences around climate are so strong. And I'm going to say a little bit about that to um, just remind us all because I think everybody who's spoken so far is um, has a psychological background of some kind and so I'm sure you're aware of all of this um, but we have I think um, oh I think my slides are frozen let me just stop sharing and start sharing again good um yeah so as as we know the fears and um other difficult feelings around the climate crisis that are evoked in people may take us back to our very early weeks and months of our lives so this image on this slide is a picture is a picture of a sculpture by the British sculpture, British sculptor Anthony Gormley, and it is a sculpture of his newborn son. And made, I think, in the early 90s, which is around the time that my son was born and my stepsons were born. And I think the image just really for me, it reminds me of the awful vulnerability of a newborn child and the sense of being under attack, terrified, um, unable to manage without the resources to cope with the uncertainty, the fear, the hunger, um, the thirst, um, the rage perhaps. And so the kind of sense of crouching and hiding that you can see in the picture. And, and, the, and the metal skin that this 
um, created baby has, um, which I think is a, is a kind of metaphor for the defences that we, that we need to put in place to, to manage these awful feelings that all human beings share in their early years and which may get re-evoked, reawakened by the, 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 the strong feelings that the climate crisis evokes. And so, you know, we use defences, of course, to push things away, to push feelings away. Um, and what that, I think, leads to is the collective silence that we have. Um, the, all the things that we say that mean that we don't have to take any action, uh, feeling resentment about the pressure, um, judging others, whether we are uh, feeling that we are the ones who are taking action and others aren't and therefore we judge them, or if we feel that actually we should be allowed to stay in our comfortable lives, we might feel judgmental about Greta Thunberg, about environmentalists, and the judgment I think moves around between different parts of the, the human system. Um, and, the, and the social way in which these feelings, these defences um, manifest themselves leads, I think, to a collective view that we uh, need to be allowed to be exceptional. We can be different. We are not um, subject to the laws of physics. We must be allowed to carry on flying, carry on eating meat, um, carry on doing what we have learned to do over the, the years of our lives um, and protect our privilege. Um, and of course, all these feelings, all these defences, they have a natural element. They are feelings that all humans have to manage. But I think in our society, um, one, of the, one of the phrases I find really helpful for thinking about this in a way that helps us not to be too, um, too judgmental about the, the human psychology is Sally Weintraub's idea of the culture of uncare. Um, and I see my slide is being a bit slow again, but I'll, I'll keep speaking and I think it may arrive. If it doesn't, I'll do the same thing again. So Sally Weintraub um, is a long-standing climate psychologist. I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with her work and her recent book, The Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, is saying very clearly how we all have as human beings, we all have caring parts of ourselves and uncaring parts of ourselves, but our political system, our prevailing neoliberal culture, encourages and supports the uncaring parts. So it fosters, it supports, it uh, gives space for those parts of ourselves that want to be resentful, exceptional, privileged. Um, and that makes, that creates huge divides so that it's almost impossible, I think, to speak about climate with each other because we're worried that those, those uncaring aspects of ourselves will be, will be part of the discussion, will be in the discussion, and that somehow there won't be space for the caring parts. But I think that what has been happening, you know, against the trend of politics and culture over the last few years, and I think I was beginning to see this in 2018, was an emerging from these defensive states. So this image is um, a, a sand urchin, um, uh, you know, a, um, a crustacean creature that has both the vulnerable flesh and the external protective skin. Um, so you, you have a bit of both. Um, and this is manifested, I think, in eco-anxiety. And we think in CPA that eco-anxiety is a healthy response. It may be painful, people may need support for it, but it is um, healthier than the denial or disavowal that we have previously seen. So um, that's, if you like, something of the, of, the, of the theory that underlies climate cafes. And I'm now going to speak uh, with just one slide about what, um, what I think they're for um, and how the design works. So, again, I'm just waiting for my slide to load. Like, um, like death cafes, they are a place where we can just meet and talk and hope that some of these, some of these feelings begin to find words. And they are Primarily, I think, for people who are new to sharing the difficult feelings they're having about climate. So that might be people who are long standing climate activists, 
because there's been so little space in activism until quite recently for sharing feelings. Um, it's been seen as, uh, and I had, a, I had someone at a climate cafe just last month who's a long-standing climate activist and who had not understood what the climate cafe was. So he, he listened, he took part, and after a while he said, isn't this a bit self-indulgent? Isn't this a bit um, of a waste of time? Shouldn't we be focusing on what we can do? And um, I think that came from an experience of there's, th this is just not something that's allowed. Um, and so activists are one group of people who, who might find climate cafes helpful. Another group is ordinary citizens who've just maybe in the last two or three years begun to see how serious our, our climate crisis is. And they, are, they haven't got other, other people to talk to. They might be the only person in their family who is putting, things, putting this into words. They might feel like they're the, they're the person going on about climate change all the time. And they haven't got a space for, that to be, for them to be just able to say what they feel. So those two groups, I think, are particularly helpful. Um, and it obviously does attract also people who are um, psychologically minded and feel that perhaps a climate cafe is a good thing. And those people taking part in climate cafes can be really helpful in creating the kind of environment that you need, a place where it is the feelings are the focus. Um, they may not be the people who need it quite so much because those people may have other resources they can call on like friends, therapists, um, uh, climate grief circles, um, the work that reconnects or other kinds of mechanisms that they're part of. Um, but it's great when those people come to climate cafes. So that's the, that's the top point. Um, the, it's not a, it's not a um, climate grief circle. It's not a group that's going to continue to meet. It may be people who will never see each other again. They will turn up, they will go, okay, that was really powerful, that was helpful for me, um, but I'm not ready yet to join a, a continuing therapeutic group. Um, it's an experiment, if you like, with that kind of, that kind of idea. And similarly, um, if you're organizing a climate cafe and you are, you clearly as an organization have an environmental theme. Um, so I was doing climate cafes through my own local climate act action group. Um, it, I, think the, I think the risk is that people will go, okay, so I don't think I want to be a climate activist. I don't want to join that group. Um, and so it's going to need to be really clear to me that by coming along for one day, I am not making a commitment to join anything. So making that really clear, you come to one, you come to as many as you like, uh, we're not going to ask you to do anything, we're not going to sign you up. Um, that seems to me to be really helpful for reaching out to people. And that also applies, that, that principle also applies to um, the fact that we say we're not talking here about action because we don't want people to feel that they are going to have to take action if they come. But there's a much more important reason why we, why we do that in climate cafes, and that is that the focus on action raises um, quite intense feelings of guilt and shame, which for some people gets expressed through talking about what they know and what they have done and you know how long they have been a vegetarian or um, how long they have been trying to persuade the local authorities to make changes to improve transport for um, cyclists and pedestrians um, and um, and for other people on the other side of that polarity they will feel uh, that I shouldn't be here because I haven't done any of this stuff um, and so if we can say we're not here to share of our, our achievements and we're not here to talk about what we could do, we hope you will be able to do that elsewhere. We know it's really important, but we don't do it here. And the, the idea there is that the shame and guilt that is such a strong part of climate work, will it will still be there and people can talk about it, but it may inhibit them less or it may overwhelm them less. And so there's a, more of a chance to share the feelings um, in, a, in, a, in a manageable kind of way. Because the thing about a climate cafe is you've got an hour and a half or so. 
um, you don't want to um, encourage a really deep exploration and, and experience of very, very strong, unmanageable feelings. You just want to allow people to kind of notice how they're feeling, maybe share some of it, and then come out again at the end, feeling okay, feeling that they've done something useful, but not feeling swamped by their feelings. And then finally, the whole point of a climate cafe is to counteract the culture of uncare. It's about creating a culture of care where we care for each other, um, just in this very simple, ordinary kind of way. So um, I will I'll share one more slide, this last one, which is some resources that you can, um, you can use for thinking about uh, what goes on in talking about climate change. The first one is by Rosemary Randall, and it's a fantastic resource. Um, just one chapter of a, of a book about carbon conversations. Climate Outreach, which is a UK and international organisation which does lots of good work on talking about climate change. Um, and then finally, some resources from uh, the CPA, CPA itself. Rosemary Randall, who is a, one of the founders of CPA and has some fantastic videos and um, just really good advice on climate feelings. And finally, finally, um, a, a blog I wrote to describe what I think climate cafes are all about, which um, uh, was part of offering some climate cafes in an, in an action week. So it was really important to explain why we were not talking about action. So I hope um, my, my English wasn't too fast and um, difficult to follow. Um, I hope that you have got lots of questions. I can see the chat is buzzing with them. Um, Pedro, are you going to start this off? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. That, that was very useful. Thank you so much. Um, I guess, you know, two questions that come to mind is, for example, uh, you know, for those of us who work with um, couples, for example, you know, um, as therapists, um, a dynamic that we very often see is um, the person in the couple that wants to be the fixer to fix things, right? Versus the person who's asking for their feelings to be acknowledged, but not necessarily for a fix or certainly not an immediate fix. So I'm trying to think, you know, and I think you've at some level or in some way you've also approached that, right? Well, what happens in a climate cafe when somebody comes over, but, you know, goes into fixer mode, you know? So let's talk solutions, let's talk this, let's talk that, because obviously that is probably their dynamic also outside the climate cafe. They are used to being the fixer, right? So that's, I wonder how do you manage that particular challenge? And I suppose that the um, other, other challenge that I can see uh, is, is, is regards people who sort of, uh, on the one hand, want to come and sort of, you know, uh, voice their feelings about it. But on the other, ha on, on the other hand, are also uh, sort of measuring themselves against what they can really say so that they're not perceived as somebody experiencing a high level of eco-anxiety, particularly because it's not a continued or continuous group work, right? It's, it's a sort of one-off. So how, how far, what can we do to actually help somebody let themselves go in terms of expressing their feelings while being less aware that they might be classified in the group as somebody who's presenting a particularly disturbing level of eco-anxiety, you know, that sort of self-awareness, that censorship, that self-censorship. There yeah. you go. Yeah, great questions. And, and you know, I, if, I, if I respond first, actually, to your, to your second question, um, I think, uh, how can we know, you know, we, there will be self-censorship taking place. So just that's the mm -hmm. first thing to say. But I absolutely think this is so important. Um, what, what I... What I do at the beginning of a climate cafe is that I say um, all, all your feelings are welcome um, and that includes any feelings that you have that are that you can't quite put words to or um, feelings of blankness or disconnect, um, but it also includes, you know, strong feelings of, um, of whatever you might be feeling about climate, anxiety, grief. Um, anger, um, frustration, guilt, shame. I often name um, the feelings that might be there. Um, so it's part of the um, 
it's part of the ground rules at the beginning to, to invite it. And I also say, and this addresses your first question, we don't try to fix each other's feelings here. Um, we, uh, we just, there's no right or wrong because a feeling is a feeling. And so we just say, um, bring your feelings and we don't, we don't try to reassure or correct or fix. Now, so, so we can say all of those things. And then of course, people will, um, if, they, if they're very stuck in that dynamic, they will want to fix. And so um, let me just think of an example. Um, quite often, if somebody, if somebody does bring something that's quite profound, quite strong, um, I, I will try to encourage a kind of silence around it. Um, and then I will say um, something like, and thank you for bringing that and we don't need to fix that feeling you've brought something that you may be speaking to on behalf of many of us here and so um we thank you for bringing it and and then there's a kind of moving on which is sometimes all right and sometimes not you know sometimes people actually do want a bit of comfort um and the climate cafe may um may feel less less supportive for those people but it's it's kind of it's what i try to do because i think the more important thing is to discourage fixing and if someone does then step in and, and want to fix um i will say let hold on to that for now um, um because that's not what we're here for um and we'll move we'll move on i can see that rita has her hand up i don't know if mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you so much. So, so what I'll do next, if it's okay, I'll just, just Rita, I'll just pass on to Tanya as well. Who's been checking the questions from Rita and other people, and and maybe, and I'm sure that Rita's question will be representative on 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 Tanya's sort of harvesting of questions as well. Is that Tanya? Would you like to yeah introduce the questions that we have? Um, actually, uh, since uh, Rita um, presented one of the questions, I would invite her to uh, ask her question, and then I will. Um, present uh, one of the questions that was sent on my, the, with the, the form. Fantastic. And then I, I if just, anyone uh, else yeah. uh, that has been listening mm -hmm. wants to add a question, of course, we're mm -hmm. very happy to continue the conversation. That's great. And I'm very happy that we asked the question directly. I didn't want to step on Tanya's toes as she has that mission of sort of harvesting questions by the second half. I'm not that half. sensible. <laughs> <laughs> sensitive, not sensible. Sensitive. <laughs> but that's good to know. So Rita, please go ahead and, and ask your question. Thank you very much for asking the question. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, my name is Rita. I'm a biomedical engineer and I was in trying to be still part-time activist, climate activist. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for, for this talk and for enlightening some very key and interesting points. So my question is uh, quite specific. Uh, I was wondering if you ever tried a format of climate cafes, for example, for only activists who have been in civil disobedience uh, actions. And I, I ask this because I believe that those um, have very strong feelings to share after an action that may may have or may not have any repercussions repercussions uh, for themselves. So, and also another question: uh, Does anyone uh, can take the training, or because I'm not a psychologist, for example, and I'm I'm, I'm very interested in this. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Great questions. Um... I, I think I would say that if you have a group of activists who have been involved in civil disobedience, um, then uh, it's great if they can meet together and it's actually closed. So it isn't a cafe where people can come come along and um, you, you can't sort of manage the, um, the boundaries. Um, I was in Extinction Rebellion in um, the London protests in 2019 and my affinity group met after the after the, the rebellion um, and we just went round and shared our experience of the of being there and there was a lot of crying and there was a lot of very deep feelings and I think that is I think I think an activists only space is really important for that um, I wouldn't say that a climate cafe with its loose boundaries 
and you know really anybody can come in and and I haven't said much about that but that's that's an important aspect of it because it's about you know come along and try this out and I wouldn't I wouldn't do that with that with activists but it's you could say it's the same process just with much tighter boundaries you know um so and what was your second question <laughs> <laughs> I was asking if um, if you need any psychological background or just anyone can take the training. Yeah. Um, no, you, you don't. I mean, I think the um, uh, I started doing climate cafes with I, I'm not a therapist. Um, I have had some psychological training, but my main professional skill is in group facilitation. So um, and I think group facilitation experience is helpful. But again, not essential because what we say with climate cafes is there should really always be two facilitators. So you can share those skills between you. The imp really important thing is that don't treat it as another another thing you have to do on your to do list of activism. Right. Um, but for, for me, that was what I did at first. It was all oh, good. This is a thing I can this is some I can contribute in this way. Um, and I forgot that I needed to look after myself, because if you're running a climate cafe, you're absorbing all the feelings of the people in the group as well as your own. And so um, look after yourself while doing them. But come to the CPA training. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I don't see anyone else's hand raised, so I'll introduce the, the question. Um, mm -hmm. I hope I, uh, I made a little bit of an adjustment. If I misunderstood something, please, uh, whoever sent the question, please correct me. Um, so the climate change effects over Europe or Portugal are still weak. Desertification in some Mediterranean zones are happening so progressively that adaptation happens without pain. But some catastrophic weather events, maybe originated by climate change, may generate post-traumatic psychological impact. Between those, what kind of events may affect our psyche? I'm assuming between a slow progression and catastrophic events, how may the two situation circumstances affect us psychologically? Yeah, that's a great question. And maybe others here have got, um, got some thoughts on that. Um, uh, my my own response is to think that um, it seems that without without an opportunity to to think about the relationship between the weather events and the climate crisis, people are very good at rebuilding their their kind of normal lives, um, and that applies both um, practically with you know if someone has been affected by an extreme weather event they will they will hope that they can go back to normal um, as people have been saying throughout this covid crisis you know when can we get back to normal that is the wish um, and um, and i think so i think that certainly seems to apply with extreme weather and it it also applies to the kind of slow progress and what what um what some of the climate psychologists have found is that there is a profound grief and loss from the gradual degradation of our landscapes and the gradual loss of, um, of species and our animal friends. Um, but if there isn't space to, to discuss that as, um, as a normalized thing, then it will just be internalized and it won't feel as if it's about climate. And so I do feel that in different ways, climate climate cafes and climate discussions are really, really needed to help people make that connection. Um, and that for some people will move them to action. Um, climate, climate outreach do some good work on this. They did they did studied people during the uh, the British floods in 20, 2007 and discovered that yeah that it's fine if if there is an opportunity to talk about it as to do with climate if it's not if there isn't it just people just go right back where they were Did, what what other experience do people have of that because it's a really important question i think well i think it's true that in, in the portuguese context and, and please feel free to to interrupt or or or, or, or tweak what i say if you don't agree fully but i think it's also true that in here you know 
uh, with COVID, there's been a, a lot of talk about um, going back to normality. And, and I suppose what happens is the kind of, you know, the cleavage between these two things, you know, as if normality is still possible. And if it exists, there, almost as if there's a world that exists in normality, um, and there's a post-COVID world, and that is ir exists irrespective and independent of climate change, yeah. you know? And it's almost what, what I think is being done in the top down and ground up is the sort of sharing of the illusion that that world is possible. Um, so I think it's absolutely true that on the one hand, you know, uh, the effects of climate changes are being forgotten or put aside because we're waiting for the post-COVID normality. I think it's also true that we're creating a fractured story of these two things, you know, they're not similar forms of imbalance with nature. One was possibly man-made COVID, we like to believe in that sort of stuff so that precisely we can keep this story as something fragmented, right? Uh, climate change on the one side, COVID on the other. And I think it's absolutely true that um, for a while, at least, you know, that the, the climate change is going to the background, but at the same time not, because we're getting more and more news of climate change that were also made possible because COVID has shown us that there is a fundamental uh, relation of imbalance with nature. And that also created the breakthrough for everyone to receive more and more communication and news about climate change. So we, we're in a very, perplex and confusing terrain at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. But that, what it does is to constantly do the narrative of repression, that these are two separate things, COVID on one side, climate on the other, right? to make it bearable in terms of anxiety. Yeah. I think. One, one of the things we say in climate cafes is this is not, this is a place where you can talk about anything that relates to climate, and that might include COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it's um or racial injustice um or or politics but there's a need to keep that um uh, to, to keep in mind that it's easy for people to go off out into these other things and yeah. for some of course they're important but there is for some people it's a it's a defense against uh, how am i actually feeling yeah absolutely absolutely yeah any other any other uh, questions or comments, Tanya? I think, um... uh, I think two more, and I think that's going to be what we're going to have time for. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question that maybe it's a bit of a broad question, if I understood correctly by Paolo, which is to try to understand what kind of problems are mobilizing the psychologists. Um, try to, like, what are we focusing on? But maybe that's, I don't know if Rebecca would like to say something about that. Uh, although it's a bit being... I'm not sure if I understood the question myself, Daniel. Could you say it again? I'm not sure if maybe Rebecca did, I don't know, but could you could you please say it again? Yes, and maybe Paul can clarify as well if, um, if I'm reading it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. So he was sharing that his uh, worries are related to water origins and extreme events like fires, regression of beaches, etc. Mm -hmm. And that he was interested in um, understand what kind of problems are mobilizing the psychologists. Oh, got it. Now I got it. So, so right. Yeah. Rebecca, did you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would value, um, Paolo, if you wouldn't mind saying a little more about that. So what problems are mobilizing mm -hmm. this, the so climate psychologists or what problems are um, uh, mobilized or are kind of discussed in climate psychology? I'm not, I'm not sure. Please, please say some more. Oh, maybe maybe Paolo hasn't got access to switching. Ah, there we are. You need to unmute, I think, Paolo. Well. Mm -hmm. Maybe we come back to, to Paolo if if um, if Tanya can help him unmute and maybe we pick up the other question. I'm trying, yeah. mm -hmm. but I can only uh, request to activate. Mm -hmm. But maybe I can um, present the uh, maybe this question and come back to Paolo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that would be a good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe asked, what's the difference between? Um, uh, like a conversation um, where the theme are climate changes 
and a climate cafe besides the expression of feelings? That was a great question. Um, so in a climate cafe, there is more formality. Um, so we would start with a, with a, a round in which people take their turn to, to speak. And we also use, um, most climate cafes would use a, what I would call an ecological framing of that introductory round. So we use in CPA natural objects. So we would scatter around the table, um, pine cones, leaves, twigs, uh, shells, um, feathers, um, anything from the natural world and people pick one of those and they hold it and they have it in their hand while they are introducing themselves and they they say something about the object um, as part of their introduction and for many people that that introduction is the place where they suddenly find their strong feelings about climate and for some people it's a it's a real surprise um, and it's the object that helps them to, to connect with those feelings and gives them a kind of grounding and a security to express them, which I think may not be available if there isn't a reminder of, you know, Mother Nature that, who is holding us. Um, and so for me, that's, um, that's a really important part of it. And the ground rules about you take it in turns, you don't take up too much time, um, but also the sense of spaciousness that we try to create in a climate cafe. So there is space to speak. Um, because you don't have to convince anybody of anything and you don't have to have an argument and you don't have to say, yes, but I believe this. And it just means that somehow there is a kind of opening up um, as well as, you know, kind of other stuff that happens when human beings come together, some of which is, is brilliant and some of which is messy and difficult. And all of those things are part of what a climate cafe is like. I hope that's given me some flavor of it, but I hope also, Margarita, you're going to the Climate Cafe this evening and maybe you'll get a feel for that. It's one thing to hear someone talking about it um, yeah. and another thing to take part. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think we can now hear Paul. Uh, Paul, mm -hmm. if you want to uh, clarify the question for us. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, as I've said, uh, I'm a civil engineer, so I work in uh, different fields than yours, because we face um, the direct problems, like I said, like uh, don't have water to supply with the people, the, the floods, uh, everything, like, uh, things like this. And uh, what I've heard here is that... Uh, one of the first worries uh, that you take care is about the activists, which I understand because they are they leave these kind of uh, worries for me, in my belief, uh, to, to 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 stronger, to well, they leave too much these kind of problems. But what I would like to hear about you is the victims of the the climate effects. Uh, what things, uh, what uh, kind of intervention do you believe that it will be necessary? Oh, I see. What a really important question. I'm conscious that it's seven o'clock. I hope it's okay for me to say something briefly in response to this. Um, I, th I think a place for people who are affected directly by climate change is really important. I also think climate cafes can be really helpful for that, but there may also be um, a value in having special gatherings of people in a particular community who are affected by the same climate problem um, and uh, just a place where that can be facilitated and supported. Um, again, it's an opportunity it's to socialize, it's to feel part of a community, it's to feel that, okay, we have to face this together. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very conscious uh, also of time, but actually Elena had asked to uh, pose a question. So, if we maybe have and Rita after that, um, I don't know so, if so I can maybe... ask you very quickly and mm -hmm. give it like five minutes before we close. Yeah. So maybe we can ask both questions in a row, particularly if they're brief questions, and then maybe Rebecca can do, if it's okay, a very brief final comment, and we'll end. Is that? Um, do you think Rita and Elena could you ask your questions in a very succinct, succinct way, please? Go, Elena, go. 
Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm also a climate justice activist and uh, I'm also like kind of starting this journey on like um, connecting with my feelings and doing all that part of the self-care, which is also part of activism. But as you said, it's not so common to see. Um, and I was wondering if you had like any advice or tips on how to approach my group, uh, which also has people that are still not on this journey or are not as open to their feelings. And if I should just like wait and see if eventually they are interested in this or if there's any way to approach them to maybe mm. kind of facilitate the happening of these events. Thank so, you. So Elena, to encourage the awareness and voicing of feelings amongst your climate activist peers, right? If there's yeah. anything that can facilitate that. Brilliant, thank you. Rita, do you want to also ask your question in yeah. a succinct way, please? Yes, very succinct. So my question <laughs> to Rebecca is that, do you find it more useful to have like a, a programmed or periodically kind of climate cafes or you take advantage of certain events like for example cop or or some really big bad you know politicians uh, decision to embrace uh, this uh, more often or you just do it by you know i don't know <laughs> by your needs or if you see that some somebody else is needing mm -hmm. this, this is my, mm -hmm. my question great fantastic thank you so rebecca thanks thank you um to respond to Rita's question first, uh, I think both are good. Uh, if people know there's a regular, that's great. And also to respond to intense, intense moments. Um, and to respond to Helena's question, um, find a friend who can do this with you. Um, because part of this is part of the problem, I think, with climate activism and, and not talking about climate feelings is the loneliness. Um, and so it, the, the point is to create a community where we can do this. Um, so don't take it all on yourself. Brilliant. Thank you so very, very much, Rebecca. It's been absolutely great. It's been absolutely delightful to have you with us. And we're so lucky that we get to train with you and that we get to do this thing that you've started, you know, that we get to do it here as well in Portugal. So it's a great privilege to, to be in connection with you. Thank you very, very much. It's and thanks. It's a huge privilege for me and I'm so I'm delighted mm -hmm. to see so many of you here and um, mm -hmm. I hope you're all going to be at the Climate Cafe that you're moving to now. Thank you, thank you everyone for attending and well we hope to see you at the Climate Cafe and great questions so thanks for the thank collaboration you. on that that was really good okay take good care yeah, see you soon bye-bye thanks bye -bye. Rebecca bye -bye.